Uh, this is Gershom Bazerman, and yeah, take it away. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Gershom. I'm at uh, Lake Security. I want to talk about a uh, mathematical and categorical construction that uh, we sort of came up with that uh, appears to be real while uh, looking at a computer science problem. Um, and I want to sketch the problem first, I guess, to give some high-level motivation. David was urging me to keep it on the applied side more and explain why this is useful and interesting sort of motivation, because uh, that's what people might be less familiar with, uh, assuming the construction I'm going to tell you after the work, you think so. Um, it should be an advanced undergraduate exercise to prove it, so I'm going to sort of skim over it. Um, so, um, uh, so, all right, so let me actually just write down, I should have done this first, just, you know, what we're going to look at is what I'm calling the idempotent uh, distributed lattice completion. <coughs> So uh, the motivation uh, for all this uh, started because I am uh, one of the maintainers of the uh, Hackage uh, package repository, which is a package repository for uh, Haskell um, software packages. Um, and uh, you know, it's actually relatively small compared to some of the other bigger languages out there, but I just checked last night and there's uh, roughly maybe uh, 15,000 packages on there, each with you know, between one and 40 versions, <laughs> each with up to uh, 25 to 30 uh, direct dependencies and transitive dependency graphs that maybe run, you know, uh, six to eight, maybe maximum of eight deep, okay? So there's a lot of natural structure out there, and uh, dependencies are expressed in a simple uh, sort of, you know, uh, Predicate logic, logic language, where you would say, you know, uh, you know, package foo has a file that comes with it that says build depends on a greater than five and less than seven, comma, you know, b less than two or c greater than three or, or so forth, right? So you have and and or, and then you have sort of these ranges. And um, now. Uh, Obviously, this is a lot to keep track of, and you know, someone releases a new package, and then now you have a lot of sort of lower bounds that might not need to be increased and things like that, and so keeping everything building involves managing all this metadata. And there's actually a whole bunch of people who, um, who sort of go and help manage this metadata and test things and adjust the bounds, and this is a microcosm of what happens on any Linux distribution or something where you would have, uh, I checked Nix OS, which I'll talk about later, that has about uh, 50,000 packages. And there's a person that touches each one, you know, at some point to make sure that it is compatible with all of the stuff around it and it still builds and all of that. And, uh, I mean, a lot of this is automated, but there's a lot of people touching a lot of files and then modifying them in it to make sure that everything is still, in some sense, coherent. And when you try to install something, it's not going to break. And, you know, of course, often they fail when you get mad at the computer or something. Um, and so the, the problem was... Well, we would, um, so one problem that people have is, uh, suppose I want to install two packages at once, can I do that? Well, you know, here's this logical expression, and there's a lot of uh, choices for, well, suppose I picked A at version 2.5. Well, I follow this branching path, but then I pick this, then I pick that, and then it turns out, oh, no, there's an incompatibility. So now let me backtrack all the way to the top. Now let me, now let me pick A at version 3 and see if that's any better. Follow the branching path. Oh, no. And it turns out that this problem in general is NP-complete. There's a couple of nice proofs of that lying around. Uh, so, uh, so we're not hoping to make it less than NP-complete. Um, that, that, that's off the table. But we would like to understand what the heck is going on with all of this. And it, it's a pretty good example of just having a lot of complex dependency data in the wild naturally that you feel should have some deeper mathematical structure to it, some way to bring order to organize your thoughts about it and understand how it sort of evolves, and uh, that's sort of been the goal of this. Um, so um, that's the overall motivation. I've got my talk on the computer, so which one to sleep, which is nice of it. Um, uh, so uh, I'll come back. 
that not, okay, um, all right, that's high level motivation. Um, uh, one, one thing that um, in particular is important is that there's a notion of version policies. So you might have a package A and, you know, of course, everyone knows this in their bones that you have something uh, A at version, and I was actually, here's, let's make it more evocative, you have Microsoft Word at version 6 and then at version 6.1 and 6.2. And these auto-upgrade and you're very happy each time it does it, it crashes a bit less, ideally maybe it crashes more, it shouldn't, right, and life is great. Then you go to Microsoft Word 7, and all of a sudden they've ripped away your uh, toolbar and they've replaced it with this thing called a ribbon and you don't know how to use the program anymore. So, right, we have a notion of a ma minor changes and major changes, and they're usually separated by a decimal point. Uh, now, packages have their own conventions and each language has its own and they tend to be called version policies, or package version policies, or semantic, semantic versioning is a very common name for a, a trend of those. With the idea that if you are sort of low enough, the lower you are, the more of a bug fix release you are. Where upgrading should always be safe and always be an improvement. But if I'm a package and I provide names that someone else links against, then I will only add names, maybe between these guys, but when I take a major, major bound, I can delete names as well. So if something could reliably upgrade against, you know, you could keep upgrading six under the table, and no one would notice that it would just get better. Then you go to seven, and uh, it's totally incompatible. And so package version policies try to uh, encode this. And in a sense, if they're really true, they should be able to make solvers' lives easier. Because, well, I don't need to test against 6.2 and 6.1 and 6, because I can always just round up to the best one. And, you know just cut out all this other search space of sort of useless stuff. Uh, but we'd like to be able to express sort of what that means in a, in a more formal way and explore how that version policy interacts with the basic logic of dependencies. Uh, the idea that you have sort of a safe range upgrade and an unsafe version and there's a sense of topological covering relation where this guy covers all those guys. And so, uh, to express a topological covering relation, we'd like to get some topology. Um, right, that's the goal. Is, uh, so, uh, let's do the naive thing. Um, so, uh, here's some packages. Uh, uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to atomize everything. So we're going to forget we have uh, versions. We'll, we'll try to put them back later. And um, we're just going to pretend we have names. And they're just named A, B, and C. And, you know, they might be named A1 and A2, and A2 is really the newer version of A1, but we're going to forget we knew that, and we're just going to put them back. It's, we're just names, they're atoms. And uh, let's look at uh, the first example that comes to mind. Uh, you have package A, and uh, it can depend on package B. We have package A, and it can depend on package C. So there's two ways to get to A. Um, so, um, I mean, the very first thing you would do is you would A lives over B and C both. Okay, this is no good. Um, this is no good because what if A depends on B or C, but also depends on D? If I only have sort of, you know, uh, and I do want to only work with um, partially ordered sets here, because uh, that's sort of, the, you know, if we want to come back to the opens of a topological space, which is sort of the goal, we want to be building up sort of a frame of opens here. So we really only have partial ordering, but, but does this line, the greater that line, <laughs> mean, you know, how do these two relate? Is it an and or an or? Well, we don't have enough information if you start with this. So the first move, which is almost immediate, is we go back over to here. And here, if A depends on B, we're actually going to look at the set of A and B and A and C. So we're going to sort of trace up all of the things. So we move from having single packages to having um, collections of packages uh, be um, the elements of our partially ordered set. And, uh, now uh, we get the very familiar, uh, you know, sort of uh, inclusion relationship of sets, and uh, everything looks nice. Except, no, um, because now if you want to look at inclusion as the relationships of sets, right, so then what's going to look on top of that? A comma B comma C, great. Um, and then uh, B and C does depend on nothing, great. Um, well, um, if you want to be uh, a frame of opens, uh, you want to be uh, closed under uh, intersection and also union. So these look like points of a space, but what happens if I take the intersection of these two guys? I get A. But 
I can't have A without having B or C. That, that was the whole point of this. So if I, <laughs> if I take, try to take the frame of opens over this, um, I, I've, just, I, I've lost all of the post set structure, and I've, I've just got the free post set over sort of my discrete set of atoms, and, and that's no good anymore. So what we want, and, and in a sense, the other way to look at it, instead of looking at that, is to say, well, if you're a frame of openings, you're going to be a distributive lattice. Right? That's a, uh, sort of one of the standard characterizations. Uh, and I, I should mention, this is a good place. The only reason I can say that, because there's actually a slight difference between the two, is I'm only working in the world of finite post sets. Because if someone ever manages to uh, you know, put infinite packages on hackage, uh, I, I can think of a few problems I'll run into before mathematical ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> physical storage. So, um, so there's a lot of results that I'm going to talk about. Everything is implicitly qualified with finite because uh, th there's a lot of cheating I'm doing by staying just in the finite case. Uh, we'd like to generalize this stuff to the broader case, but we haven't yet. Um, and um, the fundamental result that we make use of in this uh, starts with the finite case. So, um, okay. So, so there's the problem statement in a nutshell. Is you. Can have and you know packages are a motivating example, my motivating example, but this is a very common thing in the world. Is you have things that can happen, dependency relationships between them, and it feels almost like a uh, nice distributive lattice, which you can because it's finite treat as a frame, treat as a topological structure, a lot of very nice things, and really bring all the powerful tools math has to bear on this. But you can't because it's not there yet. It's really just a post set. And the question is, how do you complete this? Um, we tried a bunch of ideas. Um, and the first idea was you look at the free constructions over it. And there's a number of them. Um, and without explaining in depth why they fail, I would say the slogan is, uh, with free constructions, you get what you pay for. Which is to say that the data you read out of a free construction tends to come from the construction itself and not the thing you built it over. Um, and so that doesn't take you where you want to go. Um, so we had to come up with something different. Um, let me show you how it works in this one specific case and then tell you the general principle at play. Um, uh, well, most, by the way, we do have also B and C, but if, even if we didn't, we would be there. So I, I'm not going to put that in yet. Um, so the general idea would be, um, so we don't have that yet. We want to take this and we want to make it a distributive lattice. And we want, in a sense, the best distributive lattice we can make it, uh, which is the smallest and tightest. Uh, Sort of, in some sense, a, a, so it's going to be a universal construction of some form. Well, naively, what we're going to do is we're going to start in the same place. We're going to start with empty, start with B and C, because they're, they're going to live, be the same. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to notice, we're going to say, wait a minute. Um, a built against B, if we consider A as some piece of software and B as a library, even though A can be built by linking against library B or library C, and let's pretend these are different versions of glibc or some core system library. You know, you'd say, oh, I, I got A in both cases, which is A being, say, uh, you know, tech or something. But these two are different versions of glibc, so they, they, they're not exactly the same tech. You think they're the same tech, they have the same version number, but you built it on Ubuntu, uh, you know, with this point release or that point release, and one might have a stack overflow, the other doesn't, because someone fixed a drop on in glibc. So they're actually different. So let's note that directly. So B, living over B, is going to be A linked against B and B. And then living over C is going to be A linked against C and C. So now when we take set intersection, we come all the way back to zero again, like we would desire. Um, oh, and of course we have B comma C. And we're going to note that now we also have these two things, which is we have A, B, B, C and A, C, B, C. And these are different. Because now, even though we have A, B, and C in both cases, here we've recorded whether it's linked against B or against C, and those are totally different. And furthermore, we now have A, B, A, C, B, C, which is to say we can have A linked against both these things. So two different versions of TAC each linked against a different version of glibc, as well as uh, B and C. Um, I will note at this point that there is actually an operating system that does it, and it's called NixOS. And um, it actually lets you sort of keep track of everything in this very precise way, where um, it encodes the full dependency graph of uh, everything that's built, and it lets all these different choices live side by side instead of pretending they're the same. 
So, yeah. Two questions. First, do you keep saying we? Is this joint work? or? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. This is all joint work with uh, Raymond Puzio, who's sitting right next to you. Okay. Um, I should have written that right here. Uh, and second, is that the is then that the free item is that the item potent distributive completion that you've drawn there on the board? That is an instance of the item potent distributive okay. completion. I haven't yet told you how to do it. Right, right. But just, yeah. um, and uh, if you follow your nose on this, I've told you how to do it when your initial post set is um, a post set of sets. Okay, um, but I haven't told you how to do it if these are just any old point. You know. Well, it's not named AB, but just named, you know, or whatever. Then, then you can't do this, because all I told you to do is how to put in a subscript. So this is an algorithm, but it's not a mathematical construction. So we back this algorithm back out into the mathematical construction behind it. Um, and uh, the mathematical construction behind it uh, works not just on these guys, but on any old uh, uh, post set. And uh, the core notion behind it is given by something called uh, Birkhoff duality. Um, okay, sorry, I, I should review a couple of basics first. I know it's a relatively mixed audience. Uh, I know the words I've used aren't that fancy math terms yet, and this is all very low level, but uh, we should uh, recall, um, just for anyone that wants to, that of course uh, a, a post set is a set with a partial ordering. Um, uh, meet is a greatest uh, lower bound, um, and it may not exist in a post set. A join is a least upper bound. It may not exist in a post set. A lattice has uh, all binary meets and joins, and um, a distributive lattice is one in which meet and join distribute over one another mutually. And uh, the um, uh, and in fact, if one distributes of the other, the other comes for free. And uh, it. The canonical example that one should think with is a really nice one like uh, Boolean logic, and that's sort of where we want to get to, where meet and join are and and or. And uh, in fact, by Birkhoff, which I'm going to tell you, every distributive lattice, finite, again, everything pre prefixed with finite. And Birkhoff's result is only on finite things, which, and we make use of it, which is why finite's everywhere. Right, yeah? I just want to mention something. A diamond with a tail attached is an example of things that's distributive but not Boolean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, not every distributed lattice is Boolean. I just said Boolean logic is a nice, right. <laughs> nice motivating example. Um, and in general, every distributive lattice can always be written as a distributive lattice of, um, of uh, um, built out of union and intersection of sets uh, in the finite case. And I'm going to tell you how, because the, this result goes back to the beginning of the study of distributed lattices. It's, uh, note awesome. note that you have another two sets of boards if you want them. Uh, you want to move things around. Yeah, no, no. You. My, my, my blackboard planning isn't great. We'll just <laughs> see how it goes. Uh, I'm mainly a talker. Um, when we get to important diagrams, we'll get to them. Um, so, uh, Berkhoff. Um, uh, so let me give you two constructions. Um, for every lattice, uh, there is a, or every post in fact, but uh, for Berkhoff, it was only lattice that he cared about. There is something called J of the post -end. And that is the join irreducible elements. And uh, just to return to this example, uh, what's a join irreducible element? Uh, well, this is not join irreducible. Why? Because you can build it as a join of these two things. This is join irreducible because there's no two elements that join to it. Um, so th that's all that means. So given any uh, poset or any distributive lattice or any such thing, and just look at all the things that can be built as a joint of two things and throw them away. And look at the order relation on what's left, and that's a post set. So J of some, um, it sends a post set to a post set, or a lattice to a post set. Okay. And now I'm going to tell you another thing. Oh, O. Oh. And O is the downset construction. And this is ubiquitous, right? And what does that do? Given any post set, um, I'm going to look at all the down-closed sets of that post set, right? So it's not all the possible sets of elements. So if I have a comma, if I have this point in here, I better have this point in that point. It's down-closed. If I have this point, I better have this point in that point. So if I have both these points, I better be down-closed under uh, both of them. Um, now, um, of course, down-closure will give you back things that didn't exist before. Uh, right? It's potentially going to be significantly larger. Um, <laughs> In fact, almost inevitably. Um, 
you know, um, it's down closure. Uh, down, uh, down closure, which is also sometimes written as the down arrow. Um, uh, down closure, uh, we'll note um, in something like this. Um, uh, I want to say that down closure. Uh, down closure gives you back more things. Um, it's an injection, however, that's what I wanted to say. So, um, any point in the original set injects into the down closure of it by looking at just the down closure of that particular point in, in a very natural way. And, and it's functorial, and when you think of these guys as category and all the good things you like. So, these are incredibly common operations. Uh, theorem, um, very off. Um, um, L A for L A distributed lattice um, O uh, of J of L equals L equivalent to L if you prefer. Uh, so that's Burkhoff duality. Um, it actually extends. It says that the category of partially ordered sets is equivalent to the category of distributive lattices. Because every partially ordered set will correspond to a different distributive lattice. Every distributive lattice will have a different, um, you know, collection of joint irreducibles uh, that constitute what I would call its basis. In a sense, it's exactly the same as how that vector space has a basis. And um, furthermore, right, it extends to a functor in the sense that um, the um, every uh, morphism of post sets. Then, when you have a post set, the morphism is just a monotone function extends to a homomorphism of distributive lattices, which is to say it's a monotone function that also preserves joins and meets. And it happens to be the case that if you preserve joins and meets, then you will also preserve the distributive law between joins and meets if it exists. And therefore, a homomorphism of lattices is a preserved joint and meets. A homomorphism of distributive lattices is the same thing. It just <coughs> happens to preserve distributive structure as well. So that's a very powerful theorem, Dorkoff duality. And, uh, this only works in the finite case. There's a version for the infinite case called Priestley duality, but it doesn't take you to post sets. It takes you to these guys called Priestley spaces, and uh, I'm not using that. Um, maybe I could, but not yet. Um, so there's a whole bunch of people that you can read uh, really good papers from uh, my Dirk and others who have done a lot, much more recently, on, on generalized duality theory. It's like various versions of this sort of drive a lot of cool order theory research even these days. Uh, we're just going to make use of Burkhoff directly. So here's the thing that, uh, for some reason, doesn't seem to have been observed until now. Uh, let's call it a theorem. Um, let's use this board. Theorem. Um, Posiano. Me. Um, when... Uh, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, we don't need to win anything, actually. Um, uh, we'll say O of uh, J of P, right? That was L, a distributive lattice. That's broke off duality. O of J of P, P, any poset is the idempotent uh, distributive lattice completion. And uh, I'm going to unpack what that means in a precise sense. There's one question. I, I, I know what J of a lattice is. Mm -hmm. What's J of a post set? It's the same thing. Um, even if not all joints exist, uh, here's something that's not a lattice. It's just a tree, right? Okay. It's not joints. Um, but some things have joints. So whatever, whatever two things have at least upper bound, you keep it. And whenever they don't, they don't. But join is unique. Um, or join my uh, unique, yeah, a uh, unique least upper bound. That's un least, yes. Okay, thanks. So, um, sorry, right in the yeah. Just a technical, when you're dealing with things that aren't necessarily lattices, it's safer to take joins of sets which may not be always pairwise. Because I could have three things that I would join that pairwise don't. Okay. Just to be careful. Yeah. When it's not a lattice. Yeah, got In it. case of a lattice, okay. pairwise joins suffice to make them all. Got it. Thank okay. you. Uh, so, let me tell you what that means because, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you could, you know, you, you could write a million sort of 
things that are inimpotent and yeah, yeah. put you in the distributive lattice, and some are going to be really bad, and some are going to be better. And I want to tell you in what sense that, that, that this is actually a very good one. Um, and uh, so, and because, um, yeah, I've already burned a half hour, and I want to get to back to applications, um, I'm, I'm not going to sketch the proofs in great detail. I'll just tell you the sort of uh, the properties that we've proved, and then I'll tell you how we're going to put it to use uh, so that I can maybe get to the second half of the talk. So, uh, by the way, we call O of J of P M for Merkle, uh, and if I get to Merkle trees, I'll tell you why. Uh, M E R K L E, not, not as in uh, Angela. Um, so, so, what are some properties of M of P? Uh, M of P is the greatest coset. Such that uh, uh, is the greatest post-set um, Q, such that Q um, J of Q uh, equals J of P. Okay, so that's a universal way to characterize uh, one of its properties. That follows pretty immediately. Uh, what do you mean by presented by greatest post-set? Um, uh, post-sets have an ordering under inclusion. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> inclusion order. Yeah, okay, got it. Opposed sets. Well, the same set? Uh, no. In general. So. Well, he means inclusion as in monomorphism. Yeah. Oh, Monos. Yeah. okay. Injection, yeah, okay. Um, sorry. Um, I'm going to run through this pretty quick. Um, uh, uh, I'm just going to tell you. It's an embedding. And that's sort of the gimmick behind Which it that you've got to realize is J of P naively looks like it wouldn't. Be an embedding because What's J of P throws things away. You you threw away everything that wasn't joining reducible. You're saying there's an embedding from P into O into M of P? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It must be. Now the problem is how can that be? J threw things away. Not you, J. Um, uh, well, what happens is the magic trick is that everything that J throws away, O puts back. And that's sort of what makes the whole machinery go. Is you prove that. And so that even though this is not an embedding, the composite's an embedding. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, it's inimpotent. Uh, that follows immediately from Birkhoff, right? Because clearly, once you're a distributive lattice, you know that that's, <laughs> that's Birkhoff's theorem. So um, it must be inimpotent. Um, and now I'm going to give you the, well, first I'm going to say that there exists a morphism class that I'm calling distributive morphism. It may have a better name. Uh, I'll tell you what constitutes this class in a minute, because it's a bit funny. But I'll tell you what you can do with it. So, um, the morphism, which is distributive, which means it preserves all meets, but only certain ones, and I'll tell you which ones in a minute. Uh, I didn't get to go over earlier the, the details of this. Um, then, you have the uh, following factorization property, which is the universal property you would like, which is for any post at P, this injection into M of P, um, and now here's any distributive lattice L, right, and this is any function f. Then what I am saying is that uh, where f is a distributive morphism. Oh, wait. Okay. So assuming. Assuming that f is a distributive morphism, there is a c and g. Uh, and, and, and g, yeah, is a uh, homomorphism of distributive lattices. So this is the sense in which this is the best choice. Is it's universal with regards to uh, this class of distributive morphisms. And every distributive morphism embedded in or function here will uniquely factor. So, so L has to be a distributive lattice. Yeah, L is a distributive lattice. Okay. And, and you're going to tell us what it is. And then the definition of distributive map from just a post set to a distributive lattice is. That's what's that's, coming. That's he what's hasn't gotten what that. That's okay. okay. So oh, sorry. The, the trick is you had to pick out something because for some counting arguments you could convince yourself this couldn't work for any old uh, map. Okay. Um, and you can also convince yourself that if you preserved all meets and joins that would be too strong and you would fail for other reasons. Um, so what you need is you need a subclass of maps that sort of lives halfway, that 
when you, when you restrict it to distributive lattices, um, corresponds to morphisms of distributive lattices. Ah, okay. But is sort of broad enough to be interesting outside of that. And, and in fact, which M itself is, in another sense, yeah. that I don't think I have time to get to, the, the universal exemplar of. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to tell you what it is. A distributive morphism preserves all meets. And preserves maximal joints. So, what is a maximal join? Um, a maximal join um, is the join of a join maximal set. Okay? A join maximal set of some post set is a subset uh, which has a maximum and for which there's no element that is not in that subset, which you can add to that subset while mm -hmm. preserving that maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I, I could sort of write that down a bit more formally, but I, I think that well, makes sense. It has a maximum or a So join. say a join maximal set. Join. Has a join. Got it. It's a uh, S subset of P with maximum. With join. I'm going to call it maximum M because I'm not very creative. Little m. Um, such that uh, does not exist. Uh, uh, X, uh, not element at S. It's element at So my blackboard number is pretty atrocious. X, not element of S, uh, such that. Oh, and of course, X is not itself uh, the joint of S. Um, <laughs> um, that's just a technicality. X does not equal. Otherwise, <laughs> you've got to be able to leave out the joint. So the joint set, so joint maximal set is really, you just look at some maxima and you take everything below it, but not necessarily the thing itself. So it's a bit funny. And um, I've got a lot of theorems lying around that I'm not going to go into that explain why this weird condition is actually not so weird. Uh, the um, theorem that I'm going to tell you is you have another weird condition called level closure, uh, which is you take a bunch of points in a post set and uh, you ignore all the maxima, but must fill in all the, all the joins of everything below those maxima. And there's a more formal way to say it, but I'm going to sketch it. And, uh, uh, and one theorem we have is a finite lattice is distributive if and only if all level closed uh, down sets are joined maxima. And uh, furthermore, um, we, um, no, we show that every uh, join maximal set in any post set has a sort of a distributive property associated to it. And in a finite meet semi lattice, uh, join maximality in this distributed process. Uh, uh, property um, are uh, equivalent. So there's a lot of different notions of sort of semi-distributivity floating around that I haven't had time or honestly motivation to pick through them all and see how this relates to them. Mm -hmm. But what I call a distributive morphism with these joint maximal things is a valid notion of sort of semi-distributivity that happens to work really nicely here. And uh, we also have a theorem that um, any distributive morphism preserves joins of sets if, it, if their level closure is joint maximal, all right? So, um, and furthermore, M preserves joins of sets if and only if their level closure is joint maximal, which we make use of in the factorization. So that's how, in a sense, because this if and only if, M can be seen as sort of really being universal with regard to this joint maximality property, which is a distributivity property in uh, funny guise. So, all right, that's enough of that. Um, but, so I hope that convinces you that this is, in some sense, the inimpotent distributive uh, lattice completion. And uh, we can give it a more categorical, theoretic uh, flavor as well, um, which we're going to do right now. Um, uh, probably should put that up first. Uh, 
my blackboard monitor is terrible. Um, so M is a type fin pause dist uh, in D. Right, that's the functor I gave you. Well, I didn't tell you it's a functor yet. I just told you it's uh, operation on objects. Uh, so it does lift to morphisms as well, as one would hope. And um, uh, here we go. Uh, how does it lift to morphisms? Let me sketch that for you. Uh, it's an injection. So uh, on the things in the target of the injection, there's only one thing it can do, <laughs> which is, you know, it better lift directly. Sorry, yeah? Just before you go into that, is it the case that the reason why this uh, semi-distributivity is so important relative to your application is that it speaks to uh, coherence or consistency across these policy, um, um, you know, these, these policy descriptions? Because, I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of how it relates. It does relate to uh, it. It will. I'm sorry. I don't know if I have time to get all the way back. In fact, I can stop sketching this. I just want to no, see no, no, one no. theorem and then come back to how it relates. Okay. The, fundamentally, the, it's not semi-distributivity that relates. Semi-distributivity exists because we want a distributive completion. And you just need to have semi-distributive semi -distributive stuff sitting in there to prove that this is, you know, to show in what sense it's a good universal completion. So th this is sort of a purely mathematical result that I had a construction and I wanted to show it was a good universal construction. So I needed to come up with a class of morphisms. And that gives rise to this idea. Uh, I haven't pursued it further because what I care about is getting to a distributed class. Mm -hmm. This is just, right, it's just machinery. It's say, interesting machinery. Can you say again what preserves maximal joins means? Uh, it means that if you have a join maximal set, as we said, it has a maximum. So it's going to mean that if I take this join maximal set across um, my morphism and then take its join, that's going to be the same as if I took its join first and then took it across the Okay, maximum. it doesn't have to be maximal on the other side. No. No. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. It preserves joins of join maximal sets. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right, but other joins need not be preserved, yeah. gotcha. which is how can we can turn a post set into a lattice. Yeah, that, that's sort of why you need the slack, is the whole point of the construction is to add joins, so which, which can screw up existing joins, so you better not preserve all joins. Um, <laughs> So um, it's a matter of identifying which ones to preserve. So let me just state, and uh, there's a locale theoretic version too, which I'm totally going to skip, but let me state the categorical thing, because it's uh, nice and uh, satisfying. So I, I just gave you this, and I, I told you that it, let's just, I, I, it, it acts on morphisms in a pretty straightforward way. It, it lifts directly on the injective part, and then it um, uh, works over joins in the, uh, uh, in the basis of joint irreducibles and all the other stuff. Um, that's how it looks morphisms. So it's a, so, so I've told you that. Now, here's a theorem. Um, you also have an injection, obviously, from thin d lab to uh, thin uh, pos um, dist. Where this is the same, thin pos dist is finite post sets, but only considering distributive morphisms rather than all post set morphisms. So it's a category that's equal to pos on objects, but only has a subset of morphisms. So now you've got an injection. Distributive lattices is obviously all are part of this category. But you also got some other stuff that's part of this category. And the theorem is just m is adjoint to r. So um, it's a reflector, right? It, so therefore, uh, it gives uh, finite distributive lattices are a reflective subcategory. Uh, so uh, if you know what that means, you can get a lot out of that. So we'll leave it there, and we'll ignore the locale theoretic uh, version of this. Um, but I will say you can construct it as something I call a double basis topology on a locale. OK. Um, so now I want to talk about dependency structures again. Like, let, let's come back to why the hell I wanted this thing. Um, and I'm going to tell you what a dependency structure with choice is. Uh, it's a pair, E, DSC, comma, uh, a D of type E to the double power set. Okay. okay. Um, and this is the main gadget we want to work with. Uh, this is our initial mathematical characterization of dependency structures, like these package dependencies I told you about. 
is um, where if you're just reading them off directly, what you have is you have a set of events, where in our case that would be packages, but this works for any sort of concurrent semantics. So um, these events can be things that happen in Petri nets or something. And this mapping is the dependency structure, which it says for any event, it's going to have one of these P's is a set, and the other piece is another set. So it's going to have a set of set of events, which is going to be viewed as a, um, and a disjunctive normal form formula. All right? The first set, these are going to be ORs, and the internal set are going to be ANDs so of um, events that are necessary to enable that event. So you know, for some package P, or some package A, that might map to, you know, the set that'll have uh, B, C and that as one set and E, F as another set, and that means if you want A, you better have B and C first or E and F first, okay? So uh, that's a dependency structure with choice. Uh, I walked through a similar thing that uh, Glenn Winskill didn't invent, but basically studied the heck out of and really made understood called uh, event structures that are used in concurrent semantics. Uh, this is slightly different because it doesn't have conflicts for those that know what that means. But um, it's, it's a relatively straightforward concept. Um, is there any kind of closure? Um, actually, yes. Sorry, I told you what a pre-dependency structure with choice is. <laughs> a dependency structure with choice is one of these guys satisfying uh, appropriate conditions of transitive closure and cycle freeness. And uh, it's a bit technical, but it's sort of obvious what it means is that, you know, you, the transitive closure, you sort of need to do a branching, uh, branching chase down the way to make sure that dependencies, dependencies all are brought up where you want, and you don't have loops. And you can always take any pre-DSC and you complete it, and you throw away the loops. <laughs> and then you follow, and you chase the other transitive stuff to flesh it out. Um, so, uh, DSC. So, okay, I'm not going to go into the relationship with event structures or Petri nets. Uh, all right, uh, now, so this is, you know, this is literally, if I want, if I have some formula of things and the things they depend on, I can just read it into one of these. There's no, uh, there's no magic to it. Uh, what I need to do is I want to get back to the first phase of where I was even, right? Where, how do I get a tree out of it? This isn't a tree. This is just <laughs> a bunch of mappings. And you take a sort of a trace of it um, to get a reachable dependency post set. And what does that mean? Um, I'm going to tell you the algorithmic way to do it. There's a nice mathematical way as a quotient, but um, for sanity's sake, it means you start with the empty set. Um, a trace is going to be, it's going to be, so you're going to get a post set out of it. And uh, the elements of the post set are going to be sequences, okay, of things that happen in some order. And uh, the way you're going to do that is you're going to um, start with all events who uh, have the uh, empty set uh, in there, so that they are, an eight, they are they have no requirements. And for each of those, right, and so A and B both have nothing, then, you know, so I have, I have the empty set, and that enables A, and that enables B. Uh, a, in turn, will enable, uh, you know, uh, C, so then I'll have A and then C, and then B will enable uh, B and will enable D, and then also B will enable E, because both of them are enabled just by having B. Obviously, these two things can come back together again at some point where, you know, all of these things might happen at some point down the line, so they can union up again, and you've got a post set. And this is exactly what like the guys I was drawing on the board there, I just drew it upside down here for no good reason. Um, so that's how you take this structure and you get a post set back out of it. And indeed, this post set looks uh, basically like the post set so it's drawing, and it has the exact same problem that it's not a uh, uh, any form of uh, you know. Th th there's no structure beyond post set structure guaranteed on it. Um, I, so you don't even know if it's a lattice, um, much less distributed. You know, it's got a top and bottom. It's bounded. That's all you can say. Um, so, okay, so I start with my dependency structures, which is a model of concurrent semantics. I uh, hit them with the reachable de dependency post set to extract out the information I want. Uh, then I hit them with uh, M, the Merkle function. Um, and now I get back to that picture I had drawn you earlier, uh, but sort of in a now in a formal way as opposed to an informal way. Uh, it's called the Merkle function, by the way, and this is now worth saying. 
because when I drew that picture earlier, if I had A depending on B, I drew it as A sub B. Right? Now, suppose B depends on C, then it would be A sub B sub C, and then it, A depends on Q, and Q sub R, but R depends on S, depends on T. Okay, that's going to be really awkward to write, right? So, computer, because you write basically every point turns into a whole tree. So, now, some computer programmers had the brilliant idea. Well, what do computer programmers like to do? They like to take, 10 minutes, great. They like to take hash functions and just hash everything. They said, well, with high probability, if I just take all these ASCII codes and, you know, add them together and, you know, let the integers wrap, I probably won't come to the same thing in two different cases. No, that's not a good hash function. So let me just compress this data down into something that with high probability is going to be unique. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, you get back, actually, a data structure called uh, the Merkle tree. And this was invented for use in databases because you sort of have a compressed trace of all of the top blocks of a B tree that reflects all the data inside and you can use it for checksumming. Uh, somebody else got the bright idea that you can use this check summing in a distributed fashion uh, to enforce a linear ordering across uh, multiple partners across the world, and that's part of how blockchain was born. Blockchain is a very boring Merkle tree because they only use it to enforce linearity, but it's Merkle tree. Um, uh, the Git um, uh, con source control repository where you know, all your source lives on GitHub, mm -hmm. uh, that uses Merkle trees to track uh, blocks and track sharing between blocks. Uh, NixOS, which I described, uh, uses this hashing to keep track of everything. And actually, the Haskell package manager does internally as well. So it's actually a very common uh, computer science concept that's widely used in most distributive applications in the world. And now that we have M, we have a precise mathematical meaning to when someone says, well, let's turn this into a Merkle structure. Right? You had some structure, and they said, well, we want to distribute it, so you hit it with Merkle. Now, now we know what it means in a mathematical sense to hit it with Merkle. Um, and it tells you why it's so convenient. It's precisely because it takes something that you couldn't necessarily just perform set theoretic logic on, and it turns into something you can. And uh, so that makes uh, manipulating it and reasoning about it much easier. Um, great. Um, just enough time to get to uh, one punchline if I do it right. Um, so, because uh, I promised one more thing at the beginning, which is I promised the difference between word 6.1 and word 6.2, and then word 7. And we didn't get there yet. So let me sketch that real quick. Um, we have um, a natural notion in uh, this guy here, in your event structure, of that covering relation. And uh, let me give you the precise version of um, what that is, and then sketch what we do with it. Um, we're going to say every dependency structure with choice can be equipped with a version parameterization, which is going to be a uh, partial endo function on events. All right? So it's going to be an endo map on E, where um, we say, and we're going to call the things that are in the source, um, uh, we're going to call them. Uh, the lower ones and the ones in the target, the higher ones, okay? And we can say that you can only have such a map between two events if a very specific criteria is satisfied, which is for every possible dependency set of each lower event, uh, there's um, another possible dependency set where the lower event has been substituted for every possible dependency set containing the lower event. There's another possible dependency set enabling the same thing where the lower thing has been substituted for the higher one. So that's a way of saying that if you have this, you might as well have that. Um, and so you pick some ordering at all the places you can swap that in, and some choice of those, and that recovers you your version numbers. Okay? Now, without having time to s tell you more about how it really works, I'm going to tell you what you can do with it, which is you can say what happens when I hit this dependency structure with choice with the Merkle functor. And what's going to happen is something's going to happen to that post-set version parameterization. And what's going to happen to it is you're going to toss it through all the same machinery, and out on this side is going to come a nucleus, which is to say a contracted endo map uh, on your, um, well, first on your, uh, on your RDP, mutual dependency post-set, and then on the Merkle thing of it. So you've got to take it through twice. And by the end, you've got a distributed lattice that has an idempotent, meat-preserving, 
endomap on it, um, that's inflationary, uh, which is a nucleus, which is to say that you have an internal logic because you're distributed lattice, and your internal logic now has a modality, which is the take the highest possible version you can while being safe modality, mm -hmm. and uh, or the might as well modality. <laughs> right? If you're going to get uh, if you're going to get this guy, you might as well get that guy. He's the same price, but he's from one year later. Okay. So that's really the punchline. Um, is we've gone through this and we've managed to find a modal logic, and there's a lot more to be done. But it lets us take a dependency structure, build something that has enough meets and joins to be a uh, logic in the traditional sense, because it has a hating algebra, and furthermore, that has a modality that expresses covering relations in the original dependency structure. And uh, the preview, um, to wrap up, is what we haven't yet done, is we haven't said what it means for two packages to be incompatible. So two events to not be able to occur at once. Uh, so you can't be in two places at the same time. There's a lot of reasons for connecting compatibilities. You honestly, in most OSs, you can't have two versions of DWC installed at once. Um, <laughs> there's other thing you, know, you can try. Uh, so, you really need incompatibilities. You have resources that, you, know, you can't print two documents at once to the same printer. Um, so, if you want to model things properly, you need those. Uh, WinSchool's event structures have them. But they had to sacrifice choice uh, to get a nice semantics with them. So, they don't. So, and... So we didn't sacrifice choice, we kept it, and now we want to put back in uh, conflicts. And uh, the preview that is future work that we want to figure out, but we have some ideas, right, Tom? Is, um, if you look at what's happening here, uh, pretend that you have an incompatibility here on these two edges. What that means is you can go this way and you can go that way, but there's no cell in between. So how do you figure out when something doesn't have a cell in between? You attach homology data. So uh, that's the future work. And uh, we'll do questions. Uh, I'm, I'm way behind in my correspondence with you, but I'll mention, which I mentioned before. Um, there's long been a study for finite closure systems of what they call minimal bases. And a, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word, but let's call it a constraint. It's a relation, you have a finite set, and then you have, you're given a relation between subsets of the finite set and elements of the finite set. And the way you interpret this relation is the closure of this thing, the, the right hand side lies in the closure of the left hand side. People are interested and have been since the 50s in minimal bases. Given a closure relation, the whole closure relation, find the smallest, mm -hmm. either the smallest number or, the, or a subset that's minimal, of these little constraints. So they study these things, mm -hmm. I think. And there is already known a topological thing called D cycles. And this is as I say, the most recent worker is, that I know of is Kira Ad Adaricheva. And, and minimal, it's called minimal dependency bases, and there are like six different versions of them. Anyway, that's all. And, and I think this is, this, this is close, seems to me to be closely related. That's all. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Look at it. Uh, Could you give the algorithm for? Uh, the map from P to M of P? Uh, I guess you just look for the maximal, you take for every point that you drop by using J. So J drops out all the join reducible. Values. All the join reducible things. Right. And so you need a way to get, add them back in, and so you. Yeah, right. So you just, I think you basically joins. just, you take, since M of P is a distributed lattice, mm -hmm. you take the join of the join, the, the things that so, used to be joined. Yeah, so yeah, if it was join them. reducible, yeah. it's, yeah. Got a, it's got yeah. a basis of the join irreducible elements below it. Mm -hmm. The join of those join irreducible elements is yes. necessarily going to exist in O of J of P. Right. And that join is going to be where you map it to. Uh -huh. And this preserves maximum joins. Just yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can prove to you that it does. Well, because when you take, when you take the thing, you take all the joint irreducible. Yeah, so, so, so that's right. your maximum. A priori does, yeah. yeah. Right. Because we said take all, all mm -hmm. joint with less right. than each point in that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.